Glory hallelujah to our Lord Jesus Christ for another blessed week. I am Sister Yeye. Today we will be talking on Can a believers be rich? During my quiet time with the Holy Spirit, I read 1 Timothy chapter 6 and it caught my attention and I began to meditate on it. I read it pray and also did research and study on it. By the help of the Holy Spirit we will learn a lot on this message. As you watch please remember to share with others and subscribe to the 5 Wise Virgins Gospel TV channel. Let us begin. We bless the Lord Jesus Christ for another day. Today we will be talking on can we be rich and be godly at the same time? My youth group had just begun a study on the Beatitudes. As we were trying to make sense of the first Beatitude in Luke 6.20, one youth asked, does it mean that Christians can't be rich? The question was to be expected since Jesus' statement seemed to suggest this line of thinking. Since the poor are promised the kingdom of God, should believers intentionally strive to be poor, or should they shun riches? If we read the Bible in its entirety, I think we'll find that the answer is a clear no. The poor here refers to those who are in physical poverty because of their faith, and not just any poor person. The Bible also contains numerous accounts of godly, rich individuals whom God had blessed and praised. Abraham, Job, and David, for example, were wealthy and were close to God. Perhaps, however, there is a deeper question behind the question raised by the youth, and it is, can we be rich and godly at the same time? And what if we are one of those who have been blessed with material riches by virtue of our family background or job? Is it wrong to be rich, or to aim to be rich? How should Christians then view wealth? Here's three principles we could keep in mind. 1. We must not be obsessed about becoming rich or richer. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and the trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy 6.10 If we're looking to justify why we can aspire to be godly and rich at the same time, we might be disappointed. I'll be the first to admit that I struggle with this. There have been numerous occasions when I've thought about pursuing prosperity, only to be reminded time and again by God's word and other people that I should not. Money is not intrinsically bad. The problem lies not in whether we have wealth or not, but in desiring to be rich and loving money. As this verse points out, once we fall prey to the temptations of material riches, we will never have enough of it and we'll eventually stray further and further away from God. No wonder Jesus said in Matthew 6.24 that it's impossible to serve both God and money. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So if staying close to God is our primary goal, then staying away from the pursuit of riches is a prudent thing. In this regard, Hebrews 13, 5 is a good verse to mediate on, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. 2. We must not accumulate earthly possessions. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6 19-20 This verse paints a picture of temporality. Material possessions and wealth on this earth do not last they break down and perish eventually. What lasts are actions that we take for the glory of God. These give us treasures of eternal value. The only treasure we should therefore desire are the rewards that God promises to give to those who have been faithful to Him those who devote their heart, mind, soul, and strength to seeking and doing God's will. If our life goal and preoccupation is earning a lot of money so that we can buy a pretty house, a big car, and expensive clothes, and enjoy an easy and comfortable life, we would be no different from the rich fool who believed that life consisted in the abundance of his possessions, not realizing that there is life after death and that his earthly riches had no eternal value. Luke 12 13 to 21. A hoarding mentality for the purpose of our own enjoyment is not simply discouraged, Jesus calls it foolishness. 3. We must be prepared to part with our riches. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. 
Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad, because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Mark 10 21-23 If we are in a position of wealth whether as a result of our labor or of our privileged background, we are reminded not to cling onto our riches tightly. If we find that we cannot give them up, it may mean that we are relying on them instead of on God. The Bible also consistently calls on us to help those in need, which includes giving money to the less unfortunate. In the Gospel of Luke, the Apostle John urges the crowd to share their clothing and food with those who do not have enough, Luke 3.11. Some Christians I know don't have much, yet they are always the first to give whenever a need arises. There is an onus on those of us who have more, to give to those who have less. It's a responsibility which God has bestowed on us, along with the blessings, and is consistent with the call to love our neighbors as ourselves. So, is it wrong to be rich? The Bible shows us that the problem lies not in our actual wealth, but in pursuing after and clinging on to riches. There is nothing wrong with being rich or in working hard to earn a bit more, as long as we do not end up in the trap of seeking money instead of him. Let's give up the desire for earthly riches, strive for eternal riches and use whatever God has blessed us with to bless others. So in conclusion, if the Lord Jesus Christ blesses us with earthly riches, let us use those riches to glorify him and support his work on earth and not to use it on vanity and lust. Just a reminder, tomorrow is our evangelism day. We will be going out to preach the gospel and also help the poor and needy. We will visit hospitals and help to pay the bills of those who cannot afford their hospital's bills. We will visit orphanage homes and help feed them and also help take care of the widows too. This is the duty of a man of God and a true child of God that the Most High Yahweh had blessed with earthly riches. Wow, glory hallelujah to our Lord Jesus Christ. We bless God for this powerful message. I now understand why the Most High can decide to bless his children with earthly riches. Not only for us but also to help those that are in need and to support his work on earth. Amen my dear sister Mary. Wow, mommy the message was so powerful. We don't go to the church building today but we were able to watch the entire service on TV. What a message. Now I understand why pastor give a lot and why he is so humble. The Bible is so real and it teaches us how to live as believers. Mommy when I start working for my own money, I will be a giver to the poor and needy too like pastor do. Daughter thank God you understand the message as young you are. This is why I always share the little I have with others. Let me add to what pastor just said. 8 Keys to God's System of Wealth God has created a wealth generating system that cannot fail. Are you operating in it? Find out with these eight keys to God's system of wealth. Money answers everything. The first reaction to that statement by many Christians would be to claim that it is carnal, selfish and outside of biblical values. Yet, it is a direct quote of scripture from Ecclesiastes 10:19. Money is an essential thing in this life. So to desire money is not selfish, it's necessary. Even if all you want to do is walk the streets evangelizing, which doesn't take a lot of money, you still need provision for food, clothing and shelter. You still need money. God wants you to have money for three fundamental reasons, to fund kingdom work. 2. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, takes money. To provide well for your own household. That's your job not your families or the governments. God has called you to work to provide for yourself. Das subdue the earth. To have dominion on the earth, we should be controlling most of the resources. For example, if you don't like the immorality posted on the billboard outside your office, here is the answer, own the billboard. If the magazines in the store are offensive, own the magazines. That's how you subdue the earth. 1. God is your sole source and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 The idea is simple, yet it takes a lot of spiritual work to get to the place where you let God be your sole source of supply. The Bible says, if someone won't work, he shouldn't eat. 
2 Thessalonians 3.10, and God is the creator of work. However, he never intended for us to put our faith and hope in our labor alone. He also did not intend for you to turn anything else into your source not your family, not your credit cards and not the government. He is your source of supply. What does he supply? Everything you need to thrive power to produce wealth abilities of any kind the blessing that produces wealth I think about it. The Bible does not say God makes you wealthy. It says he will give you the power to produce wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18 That means, he will always give you something to put your hands to, anoint your ability, and bring the blessing on the scene when you are obedient to his commands. Buddy Pilgrim says the key to allowing God to be your source is to first know your calling, then to stay focused on your calling, and finally to execute your calling with a faithful heart. 2. Business is the only system that creates wealth. Engage in business until I come. Luke 19.13 Christians tend to want the wealth transfer, spoken of in Proverbs 13.22, to be an event. But God's system is an ongoing system a continual flow of wealth into the hands of the righteous. Business is that system. That doesn't mean that every person is called to own a business, but each of us will engage in business in one form or another, whether it be at our jobs, in our purchases or with our investments. Business is the exchange of goods or services for profit or economic gain. When you are employed, you are selling your services. That makes you part of the system. However, don't discount the idea that you may be called to own or manage a business in some way. As Christians, we are called to take dominion and business is a powerful place of influence in this world that should be dominated by the righteous. Another way we participate in God's system of business is by acting as patrons. When you give your money to a business, you are transferring wealth from the kingdom of light to whatever that business stands for. And if you own a business, you are bringing money from the sinner into the realm of righteousness. Then, there is an interaction with the business that each of us has almost every day. The way in which we treat another man's business, his system of wealth creation, will determine the success you see in your own wealth. Luke 16.12 says, If you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? For example, when you go to a fast food restaurant, if you take a handful of sauce and then dump most of it in the trash, you are mistreating someone else's system for creating wealth. When you rent a hotel room or a car, the way you treat what belongs to someone else and their ability to create wealth will impact your ability to receive God's supernatural intervention in your own efforts to generate wealth. The more we become faithful in these sorts of things, the more we will prove ourselves worthy of the blessing of the Lord on the work of our hands. 3. All business requires work. All hard work brings a profit. Proverbs 14.23 Work is not a curse, and it isn't toil. Yet, so often, we hear people complain about their jobs or how much they dread Mondays. That's because they haven't had revelation that their work is more than a paycheck. Work was God's idea, which means it's a good idea. God says he will bless the work of your hands. That means you can expect much more than a natural return on your work. Proverbs 14.23 says, In all labor there is profit, and you know that he speaks of much more than a natural increase. He says whatever you put your hands to will prosper and succeed, and when your heart is right and you are in obedience, his blessing on your work will send you farther and faster than you could ever go on your own. You'll find yourself promoted when you aren't expecting it, given a raise when you might not deserve it, and afforded opportunities most people only dream of. Find a prayer for work that prospers here. Christians must reclaim their territory. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Deuteronomy 28, 13 Christians seem to have become complacent in the area of taking possession, but the Bible is clear we are to take territory and have dominion on the earth. That's why it's high time we, as believers, start expecting to claim more and more territory. It's time to repossess the land. You might be thinking, well, I'm a school teacher. I can't take any ground beyond my classroom. Whatever your profession, don't limit yourself. God never stays in the realm of the possible. 
begin to pray that God will help you take possession of your land, then watch and see how he moves in miraculous ways in your life. No matter what your profession, there is territory to claim, but it begins with a spirit of expectation and a desire to obey God's command to subdue the earth. Possession of the land is not optional. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. Genesis 1.28 This is the first command in the Bible. Take dominion. Possession of the land is not optional, it is not selfish, and it is not a luxury it's a command. It's time that we, as Christians, take our job assignment seriously and become a positive influence on the world, rather than being under the control of those who seek to do evil. When you put these principles to work in your life and begin to see yourself operating in God's system of wealth, you will move into levels of prosperity you never dreamed possible. It's time to take possession of the land. Now get after it. Well thanks mommy, that was so powerful. God almighty bless you more mommy. I am so tired and sleepy. A few days later, at the church pastor meet with people one on one to pray with them. Please come in. Good day pastor. The people are waiting for you in the church. Should I start calling them in now? Yes, please sister Mary. Call them in. It's getting late. They have to go back home early too. Okay pastor, I will do so right away. Good day pastor, I am Peter. Good day Peter, you are welcome please take your seat. Welcome my dear brother. How may I help you today brother Peter? Thanks pastor, I need prayers first of all. I am looking for a job. I am homeless with my family. Things have gone bad on me. I am feeling just like a cursed person. I don't want to live anymore. What did I do to God that his wrath and anger is so strong on me? Things is so bad on me pastor. I have to beg to feed my family. Wow I am so sorry about all this. Life and death lies on the power of the tongue. Do not say those negative words against yourself. You are at the right place by God's grace. Are you a believer of our Lord Jesus Christ? Not really God. I don't believe in Jesus Christ but I believe in God the creator of heaven and earth. Wow, I want to introduce the Lord Jesus Christ to you. He is the only way to heaven. He loves you so much. He died for you and I to have the free gift of salvation. And he is coming back soon for us. Are you willing to accept him as your Lord and Savior now? Yes please pastor I am. Okay let me pray for you. God loves you and wants you to experience peace and eternal life. The Bible says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16 I, Jesus, have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10:10. 10, 10. Please repeat what I just said. Here is how you can accept Christ into your life, admit your need, I am a sinner, be willing to turn from your sins, repent, believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and rose from the grave, be saved by faith, through prayer, invite Jesus Christ to control your life through the Holy Spirit, receive him as Lord and Savior, we suggest a prayer like this one, dear God, I know I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness, I believe Jesus Christ is your son, I believe that he died for my sin and that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as Lord, from this day forward. Guide my life and help me to do your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and welcome to the body of Christ. Thanks pastor. By God's grace, the church will give you a home to start with. And also give you some money to start a business to take care of you and your family by God's grace. For now, the church will pay your children's school fees until the business can picked up. Who are you pastor? Are you a human or an angel? My whole life, I had not seen this. For a pastor to do all this for me without asking me for money or anything in returns. What are you been so kind to me? It's okay my dear brother. I'm just obeying God's word. We are to use our riches for the glory of God by helping the poor and the needy. Thank you Jesus Christ. Thank you Jesus Christ. Pastor my wife, children and I will join this church and serve the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen Amen. Let us open 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let me explain why I did this. 
riches and godliness. The word to servants. One. The word to slaves in general. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. Let as many bond servants. Paul called upon slaves to count their own masters worthy of all honor to be good, respectful workers for their masters. He did this not out of a general approval of the institution of slavery, but so that God would be glorified, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. Christianity arose in a social setting where slavery was commonplace. There were some 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Some slaves held privileged positions, other slaves were treated with great abuse. While the Bible never commanded slavery, it did permit it and regulate it. Jesus, Paul and others in the New Testament did not call for a violent revolution against the institution of slavery which perhaps, humanly speaking, might have failed miserably. Yet through the transformation brought by the Gospel, they did effectively destroy the foundations of slavery racism, greed, class hatred and made a civilization without slavery possible. The church itself was a place where slavery was destroyed. It was not uncommon for a master and a slave to go to church together, where the slave would be an elder in the church, and the master was expected to submit to the slave's spiritual leadership. Such radical thinking was an offense to many, but glorified God and eventually destroyed the slavery. As under the yoke, these same principles apply to our occupations today. When we work hard and honor our employers, it glorifies God. But when we are bad workers and disrespectful to our supervisors, it brings shame on the name of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.22-24 gives the sense of this, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye surveys, as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. No matter who we work for, we really work for the Lord and we should give the Lord both honor and a hard day of work. See, So that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed, people will judge Christianity who God is, the name of God and what the Bible teaches and his doctrine based on how believers conduct themselves as workers. I. Each Christian should ask if they are leading people to Jesus by how they work, or if they are leading people away from Jesus by their bad work and testimony. A. Money, contentment and godliness. 3 to 5 warning against those who misuse God's word if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness he is proud knowing nothing but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy strife reviling evil suspicions useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourself if anyone teaches otherwise, in drawing to the close of the letter, Paul referred again to a theme he mentioned in the first chapter, that Timothy must be on guard against those who would misuse the word of God. Teachers otherwise in this context may mean replacing the plain teaching of God's word with a focus on prophecies and visions and strange spiritual experiences people claim. It was a great danger that Paul warned Timothy against. Paul on if anyone teaches otherwise, if there be any person who either more publicly or more privately shall take upon him to instruct people otherwise. Some of the most dangerous teaching in the church isn't done from a pulpit, but in informal, private conversations. And does not consent to wholesome words, Paul warned Timothy against the argumentative heretic, who has left the word of God to promote his own ideas, who does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He warned Timothy against those who seem to treat the word of God more as a plaything instead of as a precious gift. You don't have to be an active opponent of God's word to be an enemy of it. If we fail to give the Bible its rightful place in our life and in our preaching, we oppose God's word. It is possible not to profess any ungodly or manifest error and yet to corrupt the doctrine of godliness by silly boastful babbling. For when there is no progress or edification from any teaching, it has already departed from the institution of Christ. Calvin, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, this might seem like an unnecessary warning against an obvious danger. Yet the warning was necessary, because those who misuse God's truth don't advertise themselves that way. They often claim to honor God's word while in fact misusing it. There are different ways that people do not consent to the truth of God's word. Some deny God's word. 
Some ignore God's word. Some explain away God's word. Some twist God's word using it as a toy to be played with in debate and disputes. One can be surrounded by God's truth. One can even memorize the Bible, and not have it affect the life for eternity. Curiosity or interest in God's word without submission to it is a grave danger. In our day, a time when we are overwhelmed with useless information, it is easy to regard the Bible as useless information or as a source of answers to trivia questions, but not as a book with truth that confronts and transforms my life. Bible study is not trivial pursuit. To treat the Bible as a book of useless information is to misuse it. He is proud, knowing nothing, this describes those who misuse God's word. Yet, as all the proud, they don't see or admit to their lack of knowledge. And, like most proud people, they are able to convince others that they are experts in God's truth, when they actually misuse it. To not allow God's word to speak for itself, to put your own spin on it as modern politicians and public relations people do, is the worst kind of pride. It shows someone has more confidence in their own wisdom and opinions than in the straightforward truth of God. Surely, these proud people are those knowing nothing. It is nothing but pride that could make the preacher think that their stories, their anecdotes, their opinions, or their humor could be more important than the clear word of God. Such stories and anecdotes and humor must be used to present the clear word of God, not to replace it. Obsessed with disputes and arguments, those who misuse God's word may be expert debaters on their current doctrinal hobby horse. But their desire to constantly debate some aspect of doctrine shows their unwillingness to humbly receive the truth. Paul isn't speaking about people who inquire or question in a genuine desire to learn. But those who ask questions or start discussion mainly to show others how smart they are. Envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, this is the fruit of the disputes and arguments of those who misuse God's truth. Their presence in a church body is the source of all kinds of division and discontent. Though they may appear to be experts on the Bible, they actually do damage to God's church. Therefore, Paul warned Timothy, from such withdraw yourself. Timothy should expect that such men would envy him in his office without admitting to it. That they would create strife among the Christians. That they would promote reviling of Timothy and other leaders in the church. That they would be the source of evil suspicions, always suspecting Timothy and other leaders in the church of evil motives and plots. Timothy needed this warning, because such dangerous people are not as obvious as one might think. Useless wranglings, endless and needless discourses. The Greek word signifieth calling one another with disputes, or rubbing one against another, as scab sheep will, and so spreading the infection, tripe. Who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, this is another characteristic of those who misuse God's truth. The interest in the things of God is not entirely for God's glory, but motivated in part by desire for wealth and comfort. For these men all Christianity is to be measured by the gains it brings. Paul forbids the servants of Christ to have any dealings with such men. Calvin, Christianity is commonly presented today on the basis of what you will gain by following Jesus, personal success and happiness, a stronger family, a more secure life. These things may be true to some degree, but we must never market the gospel as a product that will fix every life problem. When the gospel is marketed this way, it makes followers of Jesus who are completely unprepared for tough times. After all, if that Jesus product isn't working, why not try another brand? Also, this sales approach takes the focus off Jesus himself, and puts the focus on what he will give us. Many have their hearts set on the blessings, not the one who blesses us. While not ignoring the blessings of following Jesus Christ, we must proclaim the need to follow Jesus because he is God, and we owe him everything as our creator. What is right before God, and what glorifies him? is more important than whatever benefit we may gain. We need to see Christians who are more concerned with what glorifies God than with what benefits me. From such withdraw yourself, Timothy is told to deliberately not associate with those who receive or present the gospel with this kind of marketing approach. He does not only forbid Timothy from imitating them, but tells him to avoid them as harmful pests. Although they do not openly oppose the gospel, but make a profession of it, yet their company is infectious. Besides, if the crowd sees us to be familiar with these men, there is a danger that they will lose our friendship to insinuate themselves into its favor. We should therefore take great pains to make everyone understand that we are quite different from them, and have nothing at all in common with them. 
Calvin, 11 to 16, true riches, serving a great king. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. But you, O man of God, Timothy was commanded to be different from those who lived for riches and material wealth. He was to flee the proud arguments of those who misuse God's word and who suppose that we should follow God just for what we can get out of it. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, instead of pride and riches, Timothy was to make these things his pursuit. These are things which are often not valued in our present age, but are very valuable to God. This challenge to leave some things and follow hard after some other things isn't just directed to Timothy, but to everyone who would be a man or woman of God, as opposed to being a man of this world. Fight the good fight of faith, going God's way against the flow of this world and dash won't be easy. Therefore, Timothy had to have a soldier's determination. God calls us to be fighters, but to fight the good fight of faith and dash a fight where some may lose a battle here and there, but they will carry on the fight with great determination until the war is over when we lay hold on eternal life. Timothy was drafted into this war, to which you were also called. But Timothy also volunteered, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Timothy had to consider both, so as to set his thinking right for the fight. God had called him and he had also freely chosen. In the sight of God who gives life to all things, since Paul called Timothy to a difficult battle, it was good for him to know that the orders were given under this great God. Timothy had an obligation to serve the Creator who gave him life. The denial of God as Creator has done wide damage in our culture. Some of the biggest damage has come from the simple fact that many people no longer believe they have a Creator they must honor and be accountable to. Christ Jesus, this was who gave Timothy the difficult command. Jesus himself knew what it was to fulfill a difficult command, because he witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate and Jesus did it in several ways. Jesus admitted the truth about himself, agreeing with Pilate's statement that Jesus was the King of the Jews, Matthew 27, 11. Jesus testified to Pilate about the sovereignty of God, saying you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above, John 19:11. Jesus let Pilate know that God was in charge, not Pilate. Jesus was silent about specific accusations, refusing to defend himself, but leaving his life in the will of God the Father, Matthew 27, 14. For Christ made his confession before Pilate not in many words but in reality, that is by his voluntary submission to death, Calvin. In each of these ways, Jesus made a good confession before Pontius Pilate. When Timothy was told to live up to the good confession he made, 1 Timothy 6.12, he was simply told to do what Jesus did. Until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, this was how long Timothy was supposed to fight the good fight. There is always danger that a good effort will simply not last long enough, and end in defeat. He who is, knowing who Jesus is equipped Timothy to fight the good fight. History is filled with example of armies that have been led to spectacular victories, because the men knew and loved their leaders. Therefore, here Paul described Jesus to Timothy. He is the blessed and only potentate the one who alone has all power and strength, who rules over the universe from an occupied throne in heaven. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. The majesty of man fades in comparison to the glory of Jesus. The richest, smartest. Most influential persons on earth are midgets next to King Jesus. He alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, he is holy. Jesus is not merely a superman, he is the God-man. Truly immortal without beginning or end. With a glory which if fully revealed would strike any human dead. To whom be honor and everlasting power, knowing who this Jesus is should bring forth a response not primarily, what can he do for me? but a response of simple and profound worship declaring honor and everlasting power towards this great God. Amen.
to whom be honor and everlasting power, Paul praised the glory and honor of the exalted, enthroned Lord Jesus Christ. He is a unique man who alone has immortality and a glorified man unapproachable light. 17 to 19, a final word to the rich. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Rich in this present age, this phrase puts it all in perspective. These ones might be rich now, but they must use their riches responsibly if they will be rich in the age to come. Not to be haughty, pride is a constant danger with riches. It is very easy to believe that we are more because we have more than another man has. Nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God, God knows our tendency to trust in riches instead of in Him. He guards us against this danger, because He wants us to trust in that which is most certain in Him on not in uncertain riches. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, being a giver, and doing good with our resources is what guards our heart from materialism and trusting in uncertain riches. Many think the main reason for giving unto the Lord is because the church needs money. That isn't true. The most important reason to give is because you need to be a giver. It is God's way of guarding you against greed and trust in uncertain riches. God will provide for his work even if you do not give. But what will happen to you? If you do not give of your material things to the Lord's work, how will you be storing up for yourself a good foundation for the time to come? How will you lay hold on eternal life? Will there not be some, perhaps many, who do not enter heaven, because their heart was really far more comfortable here on earth with its material rewards? Lay hold on eternal life. Paul's idea was to Timothy, leave the pursuit of money aside and be content with your work as a minister of the gospel. Your hand is not big enough to lay hold of two things. Therefore, since you can only have one, see that it is the vital thing. Lay hold on eternal life. From this it is evident that if he lays hold on eternal life, he will have to fight for it. And that if he is to fight, he can only fight by laying hold upon eternal life with tenacious grip. Spurgeon, 20-21, Conclusion, A Final Charge O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge by professing it some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. O Timothy, Paul repeated a theme often used, challenging Timothy to distinguish between what comes from God that which was committed to your trust, and what comes from man idle babblings and to guard against becoming enamored with what comes from man. Paul had confidence in Timothy and he did trust him. Yet Paul also knew how great the power of seduction is, and how high the stakes are so he warned, and warned, and warned again. Guard what was committed to your trust, the gospel is a trust committed to pastors like Timothy, but also, to all believers. And when that trust is broken, some have strayed concerning the faith. We must do all that we can to keep this trust. Thanks so much for watching. Please read 1 Timothy chapter 6. Pray and meditate on it. Remain blessed and heaven ready at all time. Please subscribe to the 5 Wise Virgins Gospel TV channel and share with others. If Jesus Christ Taras see you all in our next message by God grace.